in other parts of his life. Um, David was actually part of, of big corporate, so he's had an opportunity to, to see best practice, um, you know, the latest, newest thinking, and be able to apply it in a big corporate environment, and then obviously bring all of those lessons that he's learned and in, to the David that we know, who works with small and medium-sized businesses in, in developing their leaders so that they can make the best out of their business. So today, welcome. Hopefully, you'll be able to learn from David's lessons. Thanks, Thanks Ray. I know all of you guys are leaders, and you all come here today, and you're all thinking about leading, and we just need to sort of switch that leading off for just uh, about 15 minutes. Um, the other thing with this presentation, leadership is such a big topic. There's probably about 50 different topics within that that we could talk about. And I thought about it and thought about it. And um, what I'm doing is I'm just going to hit you with about six or seven key uh, lessons that either I've learned or I've observed with other people. And the aim is that, given you're all different as well, that some of these lessons will hit, will hit the mark, some of them won't, but some of, the, some of you will get something from some of the lessons and some will get something from others. Um, we are all different and we all have different perspectives and trying to talk about leadership in 20 minutes uh, I just thought if I hit you with a lot of things the aim is everybody here will get something if I talk about a particular topic a lot of people here I'm going to miss and some will get it so I just thought I'd hit you with a lot of different things the other thing is a lot of people know I, I, I much rather work in a workshop environment and be interactive and in about 18 minutes, we don't have a lot of time to get interactive on leadership. I think it's a really good idea if Wolfie did a mastermind on leadership and we could all talk about it. I think it would be a great thing. But today, I've sort of got to hit you with it and, and, and sort of not have a lot of discussion, which isn't sort of what I like, but, but I, I think that's what we need to do. So just to get started, and it's sort of the boring bit, but we need to know what leadership is and, and sort of understand what an official worldwide definition looks like. Um, the definition of the ability to influence others to move towards the accomplishment of common goals. There's a version of this I've seen that says to influence others to move towards what they want to move towards, which I think is a nice thing too. It's about getting other people to want to do it. Uh, I think the simple way to think about it is leaders have followers. Uh, if you don't have followers, you're not leading. Um, people with a lot of people doing what they're guiding uh, are leaders. A couple of basic principles before we look at, look at some lessons. That we are all leaders. Everybody is a leader in some form at some time. We all lead in our business, we all lead in our families, we all lead in our communities. We don't all lead all the time, but we are all leaders. Our kids are leaders sometimes. Uh, our husbands and wives are leaders sometimes. So let's, let's be conscious, Le leadership is a thing that all people do. The other thing about leadership is that we're all different at it that we all have different styles of leadership. There isn't sort of one way. And in this room, there'd be lots of different styles. Although given the nature of this type of group, we tend to be all fairly collaborative. In other corporate worlds, there's a lot of coercives and there's a lot of different styles depending on who you're with. Another key principle is that there's two sides to leadership. One is around your personality and character and the other is around your knowledge and skills. There are leaders who are very charismatic and they'd sit up in this space and even right up the top and when they speak you follow and it wouldn't matter too much whether they really know a lot, they're just really charismatic. You've got to be a little careful of the charismatics. The other end are people who are very knowledgeable and skillful but they're not so charismatic and they might be really good leaders but it takes a little while to warm to them, it takes a little while to catch on that there's somebody you should follow. This is a really fundamental principle I think. You often meet people and you can't help following just because they're in the charismatic space and it's very important to understand there's two sides to this. Uh, this is a, I think just a useful thing that I threw in. It's really good to understand that we're all managers and leaders and they're quite different things and each day I think it's, a good, it's good to be aware there are moments when you need to manage and there are moments when you need to lead and that you can be conscious of this and say, I need to manage that situation, which is very process policy standards oriented, or I need to lead it, which, which is usually more relationship oriented. I've got a fuller list of this, which I can send to everybody. 
that's quite a, quite a detailed list of the differences. I threw this in because it's such a key message, general message. Uh, it comes from Vince Lombardi. He's, he's the coach to the corporates in the US. He coaches the, the big CEOs of the biggest companies in the world. And um, he says, improving leadership begins with self-knowledge. I just think this is a really key message. That if you go to leadership books and read how to be a good leader, and you don't know who you are, and you don't know your own style, and you don't know your own strengths and weaknesses, you can get very confused and on the wrong track. That it's a really good place to start is to know who you are. Um, I've also got a really good uh, self-evaluation on leadership sheet that asks loads and loads of questions. And it's, I find it really interesting because I go through and I hit quite a few, but I still don't hit some. And it's like, we've all got these spots that we've got strengths and things to work on. And I'm happy to send that to everybody too. It is a really nice thing just to sit down and go through. Okay, lessons. I put these three up as the things, the first three things I, I remember that stuck in my mind. Uh, this first one on responsibility, I, this is about my father, so I, I got my first team and I was quite young and I had three staff and it was the first time I was given staff and I, I sort of had no idea. And I told my dad I was sort of a bit proud and he said, it's, that's such a great thing. And he said, keep in mind that you have a great responsibility now and I went, what? You know, I'm just a team leader with a bunch of people. And he said, it is a very powerful responsibility when you lead a team. And it's, it's, it's somewhat like a parent and their children. That's the way he put it. That if a, if a supervisor says to their staff, you've done a great job, that's really good. They really take it on. And it's quite personal. And if you say to your staff, you're hopeless, particularly when they're young, they can carry that pretty well their whole career. So, and that really stuck with me that, that responsibility you have to the people who work for you is really critical and I meet a lot of people who sort of don't get that, they don't sort of realise that. That's fair enough, right? Second one was mentors. I was in a corporation where mentoring was the standard pattern. So very quickly when you supervised, you were given a formal mentor relationship. It wasn't an accidental thing. I asked Anne along because she's, Anne's like, I think, guru, guru on mentoring. Uh, Anne, and teaches the corporates in Sydney and, and, around, and around Australia. Uh, these are personal things for me. The, the, the mentoring thing I found very early on very powerful. Always finding people who knew a bit more than me. When you start a business, look for someone who's been in business for one year. And it's amazing what you can learn quickly. If you've been in business two years, find somebody who's been in business five years. Find that person who's just ahead of you and you just learn so fast. And I've done that for for 25 years and I've always had mentors and I just find that's a very powerful lesson. Uh, about teams. Now we're going to talk a bit about this in a few foils. Um, this is sort of my fundamental favourite topic around business and people. I had a project uh, that was an 18 month long project with seven project teams plus some, there were some other high level teams for quality control and methodology and so on but these were the doers. And I had these seven teams, and this was a large IT project. And we were tracking weekly against targets. And five of the teams were hitting targets every single week, just like clockwork. And two of them never hit. Two of them were real problems. And as a leader, I'm trying to fix it. So I'm spending, I'd spending 80% of my work week trying to help these two teams and trying to make it work. And getting it better, but it wasn't the way to keep it going. And we happened at the time to have a consultant who was, who, uh, 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 who was brought in, because this was quite a significant project, and he was a project management consultant. He said, project management is all about people, it's not about projects. And he said, we need to profile these people. And we all went away for three days and we did some profiling. And that was, a, that was like, if I look back over a career, I think that moment was the one that I learnt more about managing and leading than at, at any other time. And we profiled all the teams and we found both these teams were dysfunctional teams on personalities, not on skills and knowledge. And I switched one person from this team and one from this team and switched them over. 
and the next week they all hit target. And I didn't have to manage. And that was a fundamental life lesson for me, that often the problems aren't management process problems, often they're leadership personality problems. The thing about that is you can't learn, you, it's hard to learn that unless you've got a whole set of teams that you can see two and see five. If you've got one team, you just don't know. And I happened to be in a place where I could see seven teams and see it. I tell small business, they wouldn't notice that if they got a small team, it's dysfunctional. You just don't know. You just think it's a team not working right. But there's a missing element somewhere. And you can be managing it for years and years, running your business, and it's never quite right. And hopefully, I'll show you a couple of things now that you can find, uh, like I did then, you might find something that's been not quite right for a very long time, turns out to be really right fairly easily. It's possible. I'm going to show you three ways to profile. These are, the, these are like common ones. Uh, Ray and Anne would do these sorts of things. Uh, I do these sorts of things, but I, I do it fairly quick, easy versions. Um, and I assume some of you have probably done these. I'm going to show you three because if I show you one, it won't fit. It'll fit a few people, but this style's here. This is the disk model. This one looks at teams to determine whether people are a D, an I, an S, or a C. And the sort of general goal here is to look at a team and know that you've got all four. A team could be not working quite right because one of these is missing and it just doesn't work. That's a simple one. This is the one we used with the seven teams, Melbourne team roles. This is for larger groups and larger, where you're looking for all these sorts of roles within a large project. If you're a project style business running large projects, with lots of people involved, this is a very good tool to understand the dynamics of the team. Um, can we just flick back for a second? Um, there's things in here like complete a finisher, the person who's the perfectionist quality person. If you're running a business and you keep getting lots of things going wrong, or lots of client complaints because these things aren't quite right, you might be missing an element like that. You've got a team of three or four people, but none of them have really got that. And you can say we do quality and we do all these process things on quality, but you still don't get it because the personality is not there. It doesn't matter about the process, it still doesn't work. Uh, that's just one example. Okay. Now put Myers Briggs up. If, has anyone heard of Myers Briggs? A few people? It's, it's, I, I consider it the more corporate profiling tool. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but if you work for a large company in Sydney, and you go for an executive job, you have to have done this, or well, they'll do it. It's, it's a standard, is that reasonable? It's, it's the standard model in the corporate world to determine leadership and leadership styles for executives. So if you work in large companies, this is really common at management, senior management level, and in a really good organisation, everybody knows everybody else. I've worked um, where I, I know when I have a, uh, in the corporate world, when I have a particular issue with my business and it requires a certain style of leadership that isn't my style, I know I can call a guy down the hall because he's that style and he knows my style and he'll call me in to help him. And you sort of cross mentor when you understand this. Now those three, has anyone here done any of those three? We got hands? Hey, how oh, you all know this stuff. Uh, I would say, this, to me, this is a key part of the knowing yourself first. And I would say, if you've done this, to look at it again and be really familiar with who you are and what your style is. The other thing is to think about your staff, not necessarily this one, but maybe the, di the disc ones, one you can do almost sitting by yourself thinking about them. It's a nice exercise to think, I've got a team and I wonder where they fit in that model and go, ah, oh, I've got a bunch of people that are all like that and I haven't got somebody who's like that. Okay. Key lesson, two views of your team. This one I have in my mind, I, from a long time ago, this sticks in my mind all, this, all the time. That we, when you create a team, we often think of, we have functions to fill. We're looking for a marketing person, ops person, admin person, and you look for somebody who knows how to do that and that you like. And often you pick people who all have the skills, but they're all the same sort of personality because you like them. 
and what you're doing is you're picking on the left side. That's what most of us do. The right side is to say, what are the roles I need in the business? I'm a business that needs a lot of energy, so I need people with a lot of fire. And you sometimes think this, but you may not do it that consciously. Or I'm a business that's a high quality business that needs a lot of controls, so I need personalities that really love that. And we often forget this side, the right hand side. I'll say to you in the corporate world, there's a million people who can do the left side. When they pick you for a job as an executive, they pick you on the right hand side. They're looking for your personality type and your fit with the team. The skills are all assumed. And, you, and all the selection criteria pretty well in the corporate world is all right hand side stuff. And when you see a CEO move from one company to another, you'll see him take his team with him because they're all fitting him on the right-hand side. Even though the company has all the skills, he'll take his team. And that happens a normal thing. Uh, another favourite topic, about alignment. This is very, I think, much more powerful for small business than corporate, is the understanding of how your business aligns with you and how you align with your team. And if you, it's a nice little one just to get this and just jot a few things in the boxes. If you think about your values are, it must be right, it must be right, and your business is one where being right doesn't really matter that much, then you're not quite in line and the must be right doesn't matter that much for you. Often what happens in uh, Berger, um, Gerber, in the e-myth, uh, a, a key message he put in there is that people's businesses are a reflection of the people and their businesses look just like them. And when you look at a business and look at how it all is working, it tells you everything about the business owner. And when you look at the business owner, you can guess a whole lot of things about the business. Um, this is a fundamental of business coaching, that when you look at and you ask questions about the business, you're going, aha, aha, it's telling me all about the owner. And the two of them go together. And if you can do something that helps the owner shift in the right direction, the, build, the business will shift in the right direction automatically. Um, that's standard coaching stuff. Uh, stay on that for a second. If you look at a business that has to be very punctually open and closed, has to be really tidy, uh, a lot of retailers are like this, and you're a person that at home is, is, not, is really untidy and really not punctual, uh, you're probably going to go to an early grave because you're going to be having these value stresses every day. I see businesses where the type and style of business and the type and style of business owner and the type and style of team are all in alignment and they all just sort of run without any effort. And you'll find spot, everyone has spots in here where the alignment's not quite right. It's a really nice thing to look at. Okay. Uh, another key lesson is balance. This is really about systems. This was a study done by IBM. It's in the 90s, it's a little bit old but it was a wake up thing that sometimes they found that there's this success wedge related to complexity and competency. And it's sort of obvious, if you've got a complex business with incompetent people, you're not going to succeed. You have to get very competent, skilled people to do the role. And when your competency and, and raise, this is a big space raise in, certainly with some of my clients, when the competencies really line up with the business, the business works and it's successful. And often, they talk about 80% of small businesses fail. Often it's the competency isn't there to match the complexity. And you have to learn very fast. Mentoring helps, there's a lot of other things. The thing about this though is the, the message said, if you're in a fail space here because your complexity is too high, you want to upskill and you go looking for upskill. But the big message here, you can simplify your business and be always thinking every day, how can I simplify my business? The simpler you make it, the higher your chances of success. That's the message here. The message about this one, businesses with high competency and low complexity, they fail as well, which I found really fascinating. When you have high competency staff in a simple business, they go flat. There has to be an energy. That's why people, when they hire, they go, you're too overqualified. You want the, you've got to pick the right level to match your business complexity. The key here is that all businesses are complex. All of them have opportunities to get simpler. Okay. Oh, another leadership thing. Every single person I ever talk to has got time management problems. In the corporate world, 
I realised this a while ago in the corporate world, this is, doesn't seem to be a problem. This is about creating a time plan and knowing what you do with your time. I sort of twist arms with every client I have to do these because it gives you power, it gives you control. Um, being in control of your time is a very powerful personal power thing. When you're not, you become very reactive to everything around you. So creating a time plan, anybody can do this. Get a week, a week, create a weekly chart like that and say, what do I do routinely every week on that day at that time as my rhythm and set it up and get in a rhythm and say that's what you do. And if it's a non-client thing, I won't see a client in that time because that's what I do at that time. Here's my client time. And it's a very, it is a powerful leadership thing. I don't think you're a real leader if you don't do this. If you don't lead yourself in this way. Um, okay. This is a little favourite that pops up every now and then. Uh, and the last, I think. This was a thing um, about supervising staff. And this just pops into my head sometimes when I'm sitting with somebody and they tell me they have a, an issue with a staff member and I ask them how they dealt with it. This says there's a, there's a natural path for all staff, for all people in a role. The first step is when they are not competent in something and they're not motivated. This is the lowest level of maturity of a staff member where they have no motivation and they don't know how to do the job. And this says if you have someone in that position you should direct them, which is controlling. And that works, that's the method that works. You don't support them and you don't say how can I help you, etc. You direct them. When they become motivated but not competent, you teach them and you actively teach them. When they become more competent from the teaching, you support them. And what interesting, when they become, after a while, they become very competent but not motivated anymore. And this is worldwide best practice stuff says you delegate to them, which is interesting. Give them something, give them a challenge. This is very important. I have a mental picture of this all the time. When you have a staff member who doesn't perform or behaves in a bad way, you've got to ask yourself, are they motivated? No, they're not. If they're not motivated, are they competent? And if they're competent, you've got to ask if you can delegate them, which seems interesting because you might want to boss them. But it's an interesting way to think about when someone's very competent and not performing properly, think about delegating and watch what happens. This is what best practice says. And a lot of people, this alignment with individual staff situations, they pick the wrong one. It's a really nice thing to understand. I know it's been very one way here and we're not interacting and I'm, uh, I hope I explained it that I needed to do that and I hope you're okay with that. Um, can, I get just, can I get just one bit of feedback that did everybody get one thing today that they can do something with that they think they'll be better leaders? I hope so.